the beginning of the 20th century, Britain's health was in a sorry state. Life expectancy for men was just 48. And for women, an everyday experience like childbirth could be life-threatening. My mother had a miscarriage where she was for three months extremely ill, unconscious for a long time, and really people they didn't expect her to live. What treatment there was had to be paid for by the patient. Doctors were a luxury which many found hard to afford. It was only when we were quite seriously ill that we asked him to come. We had all sorts of other scrapes, cuts. They just were bandaged up and hoped we got better. In fact, getting access to healthcare at all wasn't easy. This is a very, very ramshackle, uh, chaotic, disorganized set of services. There's no doubt about that. With the system failing to deliver, many people took matters into their own hands. They organized their own health care in their own communities. If people wanted something done, they had to do it for themselves. And the best way to do it was by clubbing together. And others experimented with new ways to stop people from getting ill in the first place. We were guinea pigs. It wasn't just me, we were all guinea pigs. And it changed my life. This is the story of how ordinary people, GPs, midwives and local councils cope with sickness and disease at home and in their communities. Of the struggle to improve the nation's health. And of how radical new ideas would eventually help create a system of health care for all. Efforts to deal with the poor state of Britain's health had begun during the 19th century. Newly created public health departments had organized programs of slum clearance and improved sanitation that brought an end to epidemics of infectious diseases. The emphasis now switched to the health of the individual. What had happened was we'd lost the epidemics of cholera, typhus, even smallpox was, was going into decline because the sanitary surveillance had been so good. By the early 20th century, the focus is shifting from environment to, to personal, to the individual. The general health of people in Britain at the time was a cause for concern, highlighted by the shockingly poor state of volunteers for the Boer War. Most had been rejected for being too small and underweight. Government committees were set up to look into the problem of what they described as national degeneration, and in particular, the high numbers of children who died in the first year of life. There was a growing realization that the high cost of infant deaths was weakening the country at that time that Britain was losing pace with its international competitors, such as Germany, America, and Japan. And so to ensure that Britain was producing a fit, healthy, productive industrial population, attention came to be focused on infant welfare and all sorts of different reforms passed to try to improve the standard of infant health. In 1900, out of every 1,000 babies born, more than 150 would die before their first birthday. Their mothers fared little better. Maternal deaths in childbirth were as high as they had been in the 1850s. So, if the nation's health was to be improved, the moment of birth was an obvious place to start. The spotlight turned on midwives. They delivered most of the nation's babies and for centuries had worked independently from the medical profession who'd shown little interest in them. They were untrained, 
unregulated and often unpaid. At the beginning of the 20th century, everything changed for midwifery. There had been a campaign building up steam throughout the last kind of 20 years of the 19th century, looking at registering midwives and actually bringing in some kind of compulsory training. There was also a growing belief that given that midwives were delivering the vast majority of babies that were born in the country, there ought to be some way of knowing who they were and perhaps policing what they were doing. The campaign led in 1902 to the first state regulation of midwives. A central board was set up to ensure minimum professional standards and compulsory registration and training. But there was another problem. Midwives were self-employed and without a guaranteed income, they had to find other ways to supplement their earnings. Ilfra Goldberg remembers the novel approach of her village midwife. We had a wonderful midwife who doubled up as a chimney sweep and she used to go through the village in a pony and cart, um, a white pony and a cart, and she had her chimney sweep brushes in the cart, but she also was a qualified midwife, and so people would stop her and um, she would come in and help with deliveries as well. I've never heard of a midwife also operating as a chimney sweep, um, but it certainly was true that midwives weren't that often operating purely as midwives. You find midwives who are taking in washing, taking in lodgers, minding other people's children, or doing piecework at home, simply because they couldn't earn enough money from delivering babies. By the mid-1930s, the reforms had turned midwifery into a far more professional service but there just were not enough of them. In 1936, legislation was brought in which made local authorities pay midwives a salary and a pension. The changes attracted an influx of new recruits. Grace Lowe was one of them. Well, my mother left school at 14, as they would in those days, but she'd always been determined that she wanted to be a midwife. And very much against her parents' wishes, that's exactly what she did. So at 18, she went off to a hospital in Lowestoft and uh, did her nursing training for three years. Grace then moved to London and by 1937 had fulfilled her ambition to qualify as a midwife. She began work in Walthamstow, in north-east London, but the training hadn't prepared her for the stark realities of the job. You never knew that people were having twins. They would just appear. Um, uh, you didn't know if, there was going, if it was a breech birth, if there was something badly wrong with the child. There, were, there was no signs, there was no test. People had very little care. So... They never knew what they were going to or how it was going to happen. And she said that used to be really very frightening. The only equipment you could take would be that which you could carry. So very heavy cylinders of gas and air, for example, midwives didn't tend to take with them, so they didn't have any pain relief to offer women because it wasn't practical. Um, one of the things that midwives did carry was ergo. This is actually a natural ingredient. It comes from rye, it's mould on rye, and it would be administered to women who were bleeding after the delivery, so they were hemorrhaging. And what ergo does, it acts by contracting the womb, which would hopefully help to stop bleeding. This kind of equipment was all reusable. So when you have that thing in films where husbands are being asked to boil water, that's the reason why it was so all this metal equipment could be sterilised. The focus on reform in Britain's maternity services had started to have an impact on infant mortality rates. In 
from the beginning of the century to the 1930s, they had more than halved. But for women, pregnancy and childbirth was still a major threat to their lives, and in an age before widespread contraception, the threat to them and their children was ever-present. There'd be Mary, who was the eldest, myself, Margaret and John. And I did have two other little brothers. That was uh, Robert and David. And unfortunately, they had died of uh, what was in those days just called convulsions. Janet's father was a miner, and in 1929 he left Scotland and moved the family south in search of work. The unemployment was dreadful and the pits were closing everywhere and due to the pit closures in Lanarkshire, Dad came down to the Kent coalfield and people were coming from all over the country to Kent. Janet's father found a job, but life was tough and her mother's health suffered. Pregnant once again, she fell ill with a highly dangerous infection. My mother had a miscarriage and developed purple fever, as they used to call it, it was general septicemia. Was rushed into Canterbury Hospital where she was for three months extremely ill, unconscious for a long time, and really people they didn't expect her to live. Mary was 12, as the eldest, and I was eight. And uh, Dad still had to go to work. If he didn't work, he, he wouldn't have been paid. And the terror that we felt, absolutely, that's the, the worst terror I've ever felt in my life, was to see Mum being taken out. Against the odds, Janet's mother survived. But at that time, one in 200 women died as a result of childbirth. For the better off, the risks were just as high, but the experience was somewhat different. Rather than a midwife, they employed a doctor to deliver their babies. I don't think I was spoilt, was I? But there seems to be a lot of attention being paid. <laughs> Margaret Smart was brought up in Gloucester and has a unique record of her birth in 1935. Her father had a well-paid job and a passion for home movies. Dad was in insurance. He worked for the General Accident. He started as an office boy and worked up to be one of the, you know, manager or something, I think. And then he bought an insurance broken business. So obviously we had a car and a phone and they had this nice new house. The families either side were the same really. When it came to Margaret's birth, like all middle class families, her parents followed fashion <laughs> and hired the local doctor. There was a certain amount of kudos related to having a doctor come to your house and deliver your baby, so there was very much an element of sort of pride involved. They would very often also have what was called a monthly nurse to come and live in the house perhaps a week before the baby was due. and then stay for maybe two or three weeks afterwards and help with breastfeeding, um, help with caring for baby, those kind of things. What a dear little soul, wasn't I? <laughs> what else can one say about that except that I, I like biscuits and I've liked them ever since. Wealthier families believed that by hiring a doctor, they were getting a better service. But it turned out 
that their confidence was misplaced. Curiously, although it was fashionable to have a doctor, it was actually safer to be poor and to have a midwife in that period. Doctors were very busy, they were in a hurry, they were dealing with lots of different cases. So you would get them trying to deliver babies before the labour was complete, or you would get them passing on infection because they'd been to an illness and then come straight to a birth. One of the reasons that doctors were so busy was because of the way they earned their living. They were self-employed. The more patients they had, the more money they earned. Doctors would decide where to practice on the basis of where they thought they could get the best custom. And what that meant, in effect, is that there were some parts of the country where the availability, the access to practitioners and to specialist care was actually much better than in other parts of the country. And people have calculated that was, there was something like a six-fold variation between towns in Britain. In rural areas, coverage was particularly sparse. In 1920, Mary Phillips' father found his first job as a doctor in a large rural practice in Barnstable in North Devon. They set off on a motorbike and sidecar to go all the way from Sussex to North Devon. And my mother was in fact a trained nurse. She would drive the motorbike and Dad would ride in the sidecar. With no special GP training required at the time, Mary's father, who'd qualified as a surgeon, also performed operations on his patients at the local hospital. They did a bit of everything. I mean, he delivered babies. Um, he uh, operated on appendixes and hernias. Uh, he would do a radical breast operation for cancer. He was on call six days a week. He had one day off on a, a Saturday or a Sunday. Of course, we had staff. We had, we had a cook and a housemaid, and we had a nanny. My father got a number of private patients. Uh, his, they used to come to the house uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, and our drawing room was used as a waiting room, and we children were kept out, you know. Um, and um, we had a maid who wore a frilly apron who used to answer the door, and then Dad would take them into the consulting room. But the cost of a visit to the doctor put treatment beyond the reach of most. If the nation's health was to improve, the low paid needed better access to doctors. The answer came from health insurance schemes set up by friendly societies and trade unions, dating back to the 19th century. Using this framework from 1911 onwards, the state would make a contribution towards health insurance for people on low pay. This national health insurance scheme is a very, very important intervention by the government. It was the first time that the government had intervened to provide medical services for a group of the population other than the very poorest sections of the community. All workers who earned up to £160 a year would now be entitled to health insurance. The way it was set up was that an employee paid in a certain amount of money, the employer paid in some, and some also came from the government, and that built up an insurance fund which gave them a sickness benefit and the right to access medical care, in other words, to see a GP. The aim of the scheme had been to increase the number of people who could afford treatment, but it still left almost half the population without any help. 
The middle classes, people above that uh, income level, were obviously excluded. So they were still in the position of having to buy their medical care on the market, as it were. And other groups who weren't in work were also excluded. Women in the home and children, people under 16 years. For those who'd been left out, it was a case of finding other ways to manage. Some, like Ilfra Goldberg's family, had to rely on informal arrangements with their doctor. As a teacher, her father earned too much to qualify for help. So the doctor would charge the adults, but would waive fees for the children. Money was very tight. Certainly some people in the village were charged. Um, and I think we regarded ourselves as, as fortunate in, and in a sense in debt to the general practitioner that uh, we weren't um, charged. Uh, it was a two-way process in a sense. Um, he, we never, would never have called him unnecessarily. My parents were very careful that it was only when we were quite seriously ill that we asked him to come. We had all sorts of other scrapes, cuts, quite severe cuts sometimes, which perhaps nowadays one would have gone to a, an accident emergency department or got some further help. We didn't. Some employers ran health insurance schemes that did extend cover to dependent wives and children. The job that Janet Dunn's father had found was in the newly developed Kent Coalfield, and it came with a tied house and health insurance for the whole family. The benefit, of course, would mean that if you become ill, and my sister who broke her arm and another sister who dislocated her shoulder and so on, things that happened, uh, you would be taken into Canterbury Hospital and that covered that. And also, I suppose, it paid for the local doctor. But the benefits for Janet's family would be short-lived. Working conditions in the mines were notoriously tough. The Kent coal fields were very, very deep and hot and the men used to describe it as Dante's Inferno. It was really dreadful. A lot of people who came uh, only had the, did the one shift. They collapsed and were brought out and didn't go back again. The harsh conditions meant that disputes were common and Janet's father was sacked after going on strike. The family was evicted and their entitlement to health insurance soon ran out. Her parents had to find other ways to manage. Dad was wonderful in his little remedies. I remember my brother, John, when he was very ill, and Dad used to go to the pub and bring a little miniature brandy back and put a little teaspoonful in with a white of an egg and some sugar. And we were all fascinated with this. We said, well, it smells lovely, it looks lovely. And he used to just spoon this gently to little John. But Janet's mother became seriously ill during another pregnancy. And it was then that the consequences really hit home. Mother had uh, preeclampsia. It's a very serious complication of pregnancy. So mum expected, of course, to be taken into Canterbury Hospital. And she was amazed when they, they said, oh, no, you don't go to Canterbury Hospital. She said, why? And they said, well, your husband doesn't pay to Canterbury Hospital now. Because he's unemployed, you're not paying, so you have to go to Etchin Hill to what was, called, was really the poorhouse. And she said, well, I refuse, I won't go. She did refuse to go. Dad and I, between us, we... we nursed her and looked after her. She came through, but the baby was uh, stillborn. The hard economic circumstances that Janet's family found themselves in were by no means uncommon. Britain was experiencing the worst depression of its industrial history. <laughs> 
unemployment reached 25% and many people found themselves in and out of work with little warning. Brenda Watkinson's parents were amongst those who were struggling to make a living. Mum and Dad were both in shop work. My father was a gentleman's outfitter in the days when you had pinstripe trousers and a black jacket, and my mother worked in grocery and provisions. Brenda's father volunteered at a doctor's surgery in Bermondsey in East London, helping run a local healthcare saving scheme, which enabled patients to spread the cost of medical treatment. The scheme was called the PMS. I imagine it might have st stood for Patients Medical Scheme. And my father had to ride round on his bike and collect money. And it was a thankless task because he was out in all weathers, often very late at night, trying to catch up with people who hadn't been there the first time he called. They were out or they hadn't got any money and they were hiding behind the door. I remember thinking, gosh, it's getting late, and Mum and Dad are still poring over these books. Sometimes they were there for several hours, making sure that each person's contribution was correctly into the ledger. But so many people, their earnings were up and down, and so their only way of making sure they were covered when they were ill was to try and eke out a bit of money every so many weeks when my dad went round. It, times were hard. In Britain, the tradition of self-help schemes for medical care had begun amongst workers and employers in the early 19th century. It was very, very common for groups of workers in different workplaces to band together and to create some sort of fund or some sort of organisation that procured medical services for themselves and their families. These medical schemes came from employers appointing surgeons to look after their workers. But workers were very dissatisfied that employers had the power to appoint and dismiss doctors, uh, despite the fact that it was workers themselves who were paying the salaries of these doctors. There were instances in which employers actually made a profit from these medical schemes. One scheme that was determined to do its best by its members was based in Tredegar in South Wales. Tredegar is a very small knit community. People are very, very close. Uh, everybody knows everybody and everybody knows what's going on. There's nothing um, sacred in the town. At the beginning of the 19th century, the town had a population of just over 1,000 people. But the discovery of rich iron ore deposits soon turned it into a boom town, run by the Tredegar Iron Company. Tredegar was a company town. Everything revolved around the company. Um, you either worked for them or, or you didn't work. Um, they controlled everything, they controlled people's lives. Production then switched to steel and coal. And like most of the men in Tredegar, John's grandfather found work in the mines. But as demand for coal rose and fell, so did the fortunes of people in the town. There was a lot of unemployment. Um, money was hard to come by. And living conditions were quite harsh. There was a lot of overcrowding with a two-bedroom house having anything from six to 10 people or even 12 people living in them. A lot of houses still didn't have running water or sanitary um, fit-ins. There was still a large amount of um, outside toilets at that particular time and people sharing toilets. The townspeople were determined to improve conditions for the workers and by the early 20th century had taken over the running of local medical aid schemes. The Tredegar Workmen's Medical Aid Society was different to similar organisations in other parts of Britain. In the first place, uh, the wives and children of worker members also received medical care under the schemes. Secondly, uh, in South Wales, uh, very, very different to everywhere else in Britain, uh, a poundage system was utilised, whereby workers paid two or three pence in each pound rather than a flat rate contribution. 
This meant that profits could be built up so that other kinds of medical services could be offered within these schemes. Tradiga became the most comprehensive of any medical aid scheme in the country, providing treatment from doctors and district nurses to dentists and physiotherapists. By the 1920s, something like almost 23,000 of the town's 24,000 population were members of this scheme. So it's almost a universal scheme. In 1915, Walter Conway became its secretary. He was a good man. He had this vision that he wanted the best. He wanted the best in the country. He wanted the best in the world. He wanted the best for the people of Tredegar. If it hadn't been for him, Tredegar, the Medical Aid Society, wouldn't have been the society he eventually became. My grandparents and my parents knew that if they fell ill, they could just call along to the doctor and the service was there, the help was there. If my father had gone on the sick, he knew that he would have had sick pay. If my mother needed hospital treatment, she knew that the, the local hospital would, would look after her needs. And if they couldn't treat her in the local hospital, then a bus fare would be paid to Newport or Cardiff or Bristol, where she would get the treatment that she required. Tredegar was also the birthplace of the Labour MP and future health minister, Aniram Bevan. The Medical Aid Society would be a major influence in shaping his vision of a national health service. But in the 1930s, there were still enormous challenges to overcome. Despite the progress of the previous century, infectious diseases continued to claim the lives of thousands of people in Britain every year. Diphtheria was one of the worst. A highly contagious respiratory infection, one of its most frightening symptoms is the swelling of membranes in the throat, making breathing increasingly difficult. The disease had a profound effect on Betty Giltonen's family. My mother contacted diphtheria and uh, she was only 33 and she didn't survive. I wasn't aware of the fact my mother was ill, but I knew that I had to go and live with my grandmother for six weeks. And then when I came back home, after they'd fumigated the house, I knew mum was missing. And, uh, and that was it. There was my sister Peggy and sister Enid and brother Trevor. And there was the baby of five months and he was Hugh. Dad realized that he couldn't cope with five. Dad's brother, apparently his wife could not have a family and he came up to see my dad and begged him, could he take Hugh? And he was adopted. But um, it was never discussed, you know. Around the time Betty's mother had died, Mass immunization trials were underway in Canada and America. By the early 30s, deaths in Canada had fallen sharply, and in some cities, diphtheria had been eradicated altogether. Yet in Britain, little had changed. The disease was still responsible for a third of all childhood deaths. Diphtheria immunisation in the 1930s was a failure on a number of different levels. Part of the problem was the dislocation between local and central health responsibilities in Britain. The immunisations were a local government, not a central government responsibility. 
and they're not receiving money from central government for immunisation programmes. And so they're very much at the mercy of the local town councils as to whether they're going to find the funds to, to run vaccination, immunisation campaigns. And it's not seen as a priority, despite the fact that between two and 3,000 children are dying each year in Britain from diphtheria, and those are quite unnecessary deaths. It would take until the Second World War for central government to act. Amid fears that cramped conditions in air raid shelters would lead to an epidemic, they finally introduced an immunization program. Within a decade, diphtheria would become a disease of the past. The country's approach to controlling infectious diseases was a legacy of the 19th century public health system. This was founded on the belief that local organizations were better placed to deal with health problems in their community than a central authority would be. As a result, public health departments were run and largely financed by local councils. And in the 1930s, they had more impact on the health of ordinary people than any doctor. And the person in charge was the medical officer of health. Medical officers of health were the most powerful local government officers. They ran enormous departments. They had incredible political clout. They were really the, the guardians, uh, not only of the health of the population, but to a certain extent the, the economic health of their towns and cities. They understand what causes ill health. And sitting as they do in local government, they are in the most influential place that they can be. By the mid-1930s, public health departments were responsible for a huge range of services with the emphasis firmly on the prevention of ill health. Street cleaning. Public laundries. Bath houses. And maternity clinics. And in some cities like Liverpool, ambitious programs of housing development. Working alongside them was another key department, the School Medical Inspection Service. Its job was to monitor the health of the country's poorest children. In 1929, Stanley Jarvis joined the team at Liverpool. My father was a kindly soul and he liked kids. He always got on very well with kids. And he'd go round these schools and talk to the children and so forth. In those days, all school children had their height and weight measured every term and they had a medical examination when they arrived at the school and before they left the school. And if a child, for example, lost weight during a term, uh, this was a cause for the medical officer of health to look at them. Improving children's health had been a priority since concerns were first raised about the nation's lack of fitness. The School Medical Inspection Service provided free treatment for the country's poorest children. If problems were picked up, children were referred to a clinic. Peter's father's was next to one of Liverpool's public washhouses. I remember seeing a row of children sitting um, with bowls of hot water, um, with wooden spoons bound round with bandages, applying this wooden spoon with, as a hot fomentation to their sore eyes because they had a uh, sty. And there was one child, I remember, who had both eyes swollen. And looking back at it now, I wonder whether that child hadn't in fact got acute nephritis. Acute nephritis is practically unheard of now, but it was an infectious condition. You got a good old streptococcal infection, and it was spread to your kidneys, jiggy your kidneys, and you got these characteristic signs of nephritis, and one of the things was this very puffy pair of eyes. I haven't seen one of those in 40 years. <laughs> 
but for some health problems, local solutions weren't easy to find. Heavy industry and coal fires polluted many of Britain's cities and provided the perfect recipe for poor health. The buildings were black with soot. Everything was black, and when the wind wasn't blowing, of course, the pall of smoke sat along the whole place and sat for miles around. It was a great dome-shaped hump of filth covering the entire district. It's hardly surprising I got bronchitis every winter. And when I got bronchitis, they would put kaolin poultices on my chest, front and back. And this was a large acreage of fuzzy felt stuff, and you covered it with hot kaolin and slapped it on, just, uh, just not quite hot enough to burn you, um, but it went cold in about five minutes and became very clammy and disgusting. And I didn't like this, and I said so, and I was told, nonsense, boy, don't argue, you're, it'll do you good. But I never did think it did, and I still don't think it did. These polluted environments contributed to another condition that affected the health of the country's poorest citizens. Rickets. Many who worked in public health were determined to find a cure. Rickets is principally a children's disease. The growing bones don't form properly. These x-rays show what has happened. On the right is a normal child's knee. On the left is his other knee before he was cured of rickets. Rickets is caused by a lack of vitamin D and is prevented by exposure to sunlight. And a diet rich in calcium producing foods like milk, eggs or fish. Some public health departments offered sunlight treatment to families whose diet and living conditions made them particularly vulnerable. Brenda Watkinson's family was one of those who benefited. My mother, when she was born in 1901, suffered from rickets from malnutrition and was actually in leg irons in her early years. And when my brother was born, like my mother, he was very undernourished. I think he would be probably not older than five. He um, had sunlight treatment also for the malnutrition. It was reckoned to build children up. He, he gradually got better, but he was very thin. The link between vitamin D and rickets was discovered by the scientist Edward Mellenby. Seen here in home movies. He argued that a good diet was essential to health and advocated giving free supplements of cod liver oil to all children. Mellenby was one of a group of scientists whose work would have social and political implications. The 1930s was a period in which the science of nutrition was making great strides and investigators were getting a much better understanding of the biochemistry of nutrition and that was leading them to draw conclusions about the minimum income that would be necessary to purchase a diet for healthy living. And what that led on to in turn was actually a critique of government policy. And the scientists weren't the only ones campaigning for change. A growing number of voices, from the political left to social reformers and public health officials, were calling on the government to do more to prevent the problems of ill health that stemmed from poverty. This film was part of that campaign. There is a marked difference in the heights of boys drawn from different classes of society. At 13 years of age, the boys at Christ's Hospital School are on an average nearly two and a half inches taller than those from council schools. At 17, they're nearly four inches taller than working boys of the same age. These differences are largely due to differences between the food they eat. The film shows how the general health of the population was faring. 
It features the work of a leading campaigner, Dr. George McGonagall, then Medical Officer for Health for Stockton-upon-Tees. He looked specifically at how income affected the diet of families in his area. Now, I've been finding out in my own district how much the average housewife has to spend and what she spends it on, right down to the last penny. He had two case studies in stockton Pontes, and he could show the difference between uh, the diets and the living conditions in these two areas. And it was certainly income that had the biggest effect on, on health. And what he did was to calculate whether people could afford adequate diets for health on the rates of unemployment benefit that they were receiving from the government. And the evidence that McGonagall found was that no, unemployment benefits were not adequate for health. McGonagall became an increasingly controversial figure with his calls for the government to increase welfare benefits. He took on a very political role, and public health has always been political from the 1840s to the present day. He saw his primary responsibility as one of advocacy, knowing what was wrong with his population and knowing what should be done to put it right. And he came into direct conflict, and as a result of this, he was threatened with uh, disciplinary proceedings by the General Medical Council. The government resisted McGonagall's calls to increase benefits, but his campaign had huge popular support and he kept his job. And the focus from people like McGonagall on ways to improve people's health also helped generate new approaches to preventative medicine. One of these was a radical experiment based in Peckham in South London. It attracted enormous interest at the time this film was made to showcase its work. Almost at the foot of Big Ben, you can catch a number 35 tram. After about half an hour through factories and crowded streets, you come to Peckham. Here you will find the centre, the Pioneer Health Centre. As with McGonagall's work, the experiment set out to discover the factors which influence people's health, and centred particularly on the significance of family relationships. It's my father, and he, he was comparing, as he would on a Saturday evening with a dance that was going on. Let us dance a centre waltz together Always smile and never mind the rest Pam Elvin's family was one of the first 200 who joined the Pioneer Health Centre when it opened in 1935. They took me one afternoon and I was overawed, I think would be the words I'd use, of seeing this magical place and it changed my life. Membership was by subscription and open to families in employment who live within pram-pushing distance of the centre. The way the Peckham Centre was planned was as a scientific experiment and what they did was to set out a series of buildings centred really around a social club where people would be attracted into the centre. There they could be examined and monitored and surveyed. An old-fashioned big brother, if you like. The idea came from two biologists, Innes Pierce and George Scott Williamson. And what we are trying to do is to study health, find out what health is. And strangely enough, this is the first time that's ever been tackled. Scott Williamson wanted to test his theory that by creating the right environment, you could also create the right conditions for the development of good health in mind and body. When people joined the centre, they were uh, subjected to three examinations. There was a physical examination, the usual sort of medical examination of the body, but also part of it was a consultation with the family. In the 19th century, medicine was interested in single separate bodies. So a family of five people would be five separate bodies. 
What Peckham introduced was this idea that the, the, the interaction between these people could tell you something about their health, about their lifestyle, about how they were going on in, in their lives. So the, the scientists explored their relationships. The members are, in fact, cooperating in a unique piece of research into social biology. We were guinea pigs. It wasn't just me, we were all guinea pigs. It was a complete contrast to what we were used to. I loved it. I had children to play with. I could do things on my own. I mean, my mother didn't know anybody. She didn't know people on the opposite side of the road. And it wasn't until she joined the centre that she made friends. One of the families that they met there was Doreen Heads. I, I would like swimming, so I learned to swim down there. My younger brother, he was he was quite young, he went into the nursery, you know. And my other brother, he liked badminton, so he was always in badminton court and in the gymnasium and that. And then my sister was that bit older, so she was able to take advantage of the dances on a Saturday evening. Within two years, over 650 families had joined the centre and a picture of their health began to emerge. When the Peckham doctors examined patients, they found that 93% could be identified as having some sort of abnormality. That means 7%, as they said, were truly healthy. Williamson and Pierce published their findings in 1943. Many of the children were found to have worms, deformed toes and decayed teeth. I'd previously broken my arm and they were very interested in this and they kept, you know, looking at the arm to see how it was and when it came out of the plaster they were sort of, you know, giving me exercises and things, you know. Amongst the adults, there were more serious problems. Most of the women were anemic. Some had high blood pressure, kidney disorders and cancer. All the examinations and all the monitoring was only concerned with recording these things. There was no treatment. They were said to be advisory, so if they did find anything really serious medically, they advised the patient to go elsewhere. They discovered there was a lot wrong with me. I was anemic for one. I was deaf for another. So I was, seemed to have a lot of rheumatism. and. The doctor that we had at the time said, oh, it's only growing pains, mother. But they discovered that I had rheumatism. But how did they do it? Because they sent me off to one of the hospitals in London where I had some tests on. You know, I was a sickly child, but um, my mother reckons that she saw me grow into a very healthy child within perhaps 18 months of being there. The centre doctors also believed in the importance of good food, and this farm was opened in Kent. Here, the families helped with the crops and used it for weekend camps. Life for people like Pam had come to revolve around the centre. Mixing with other people, enjoying life with a lot of other people. It was probably the best years of my life. The outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 brought a temporary halt to the Peckham experiment but it was also the trigger for wider discussion about health reform on a grand scale. From this point onwards, the British state asked its citizens to make various sacrifices, both on the battlefield and on the home front, and in return had to offer the prospect of a better society in the post-war world. So what you see during the war years is a great many plans being formulated, a growing pressure and opinion in favour of substantial social reform, including, of course, reform in the area of medical care and services. The future.
And the vision of the future for Britain's health services came from Aniram Bevan, Minister of Health in the Labour government of 1945. It was a vision in which the Medical Aid Society in Bevan's hometown of Tredegar had played a key part. Their example of comprehensive health care showed how a national system could work. But the new NHS would be controlled by central government and there was no room for local initiatives. With the formation of the NHS, the board from the Medical Aid Society actually went to Bevan and pleaded for a special case to be made of the Trinidad Medical Aid Society. But at that time, um, Bevan actually turned to the board and said, told them that basically they were a, um, a victim of their own success. And that was the end of the Tredega Medical Aid Society as we knew it. The Peckham Centre faced a similar fate. It had reopened after the Second World War and members like Pam Elvin and her fiancé Edge were completely unprepared for life without it. The first we knew, all of us knew, was a notice that went up on the notice board to say that the centre was going to close that Saturday. And I just couldn't believe it. It was like a death knell. We were going around silent, as if someone had died. And people were weeping, you know, shaking their heads. So what are we going to do without the centre? It affected everybody, from children to grandparents. The experiment was over. But the Peckham doctor's focus on good health and the factors which contributed to it would eventually find a place in modern medicine. It formed a blueprint for what could happen later in the century. There's a new idea comes into medicine, risk factors, and we all have risk factors in terms of the food we eat and the exercise we take and the lifestyles we have. And those risk factors, which we now dominate a lot of our thinking about health, were first laid down in the Peckham experiment. When the National Health Service began in 1948, it brought order to the chaos of previous decades and recognized for the first time that access to health care should not be dependent on individual circumstances. The new system wasn't perfect, but it did ensure that when people were sick, there was no barrier to seeing a doctor and being treated. And from now on, the health of the nation would be linked inextricably to the health of all its citizens. <laughs> <laughs>